Hey guys, it's Girl Got Game, and these are my final thoughts on Psychedelica of the Ashen Hawk. Before I continue, I will be discussing spoilers for both this game and Black Butterfly, so if you haven't played this game series for yourself or watched my Let's Play, then please go and do so first before continuing to watch this. Now, I came into this fresh off of completing Black Butterfly and excited to see what direction the sequel was going to take. I will admit that at first I was a little taken aback by how different the style was in this. I had got so used to the dream-slash-nightmare-like ambiance of Black Butterfly that jumping from that to what is a more historical-slash-medieval fantasy setting, from art to music, took a little getting used to just because it wasn't at all what I was expecting. Something else that took some adjusting to was the town setting of the game. Having all these side and background characters was a big change from the very small cast of characters in the previous title, but it was definitely one I really liked. I think the choice to have all kinds of interactions with these background town characters through the map section in the game was a very clever thing to do, since it contributed to the town atmosphere, and you got a bigger, more comprehensive picture of what was happening in this place from a perspective outside of the main cast. I think it also made the betrayals of the town throughout the story hit harder than if it was all faceless figures you don't really interact with. But all that having been said, I think these changes were overall all good ones, and I really enjoyed the game overall. I personally would have preferred a little bit of style similarity in either art or music to Black Butterfly. I'd personally lean more towards music than art, since I think the art style for this perfectly fits the wintry setting. But either way, I think it would have been nice just to have something stylistically similar that connected the two games. Moving on to the writing, I'd say it's probably not as strong as Black Butterflies, but most of it is done well. I'd say the story takes longer to really get going. I do think the pacing of the story could have been better, especially the early game. The length of chapter 2 is so crazy long compared to the rest of the game. There's also some sections in between maps in chapter 2 that are so short and don't add to anything that it just leaves me wondering why they bothered inserting these breaks other than to have some kind of separation between maps. I definitely feel like the short episodes in the first game were better integrated with the main story. What I did like in this game compared to the first is having the maps to navigate the short episodes was a lot easier than doing it from the flowchart in the first game. The way to unlock episodes was also easier, and having it tied to collecting points by interacting with the townspeople was, I thought, a smart idea, since it incentivizes you to get to know the townsfolk, which in turn helps to lend some weight to their actions later in the main story. Speaking of the main story, overall, it's pretty strong. I do think it's weaker or stronger depending on the ending you're going for, though. Because of how strongly the story pushes Lugas as the love interest, especially in the latter half, it makes the endings with the other guys feel awkward and out of place. I often felt like Jed was being pushed into relationships she wouldn't necessarily have pursued if I wasn't making her choices for her. I felt like there were also a lot more plot threads in this game compared to the first. Part of that is probably due to the fact that the main cast is quite a bit larger than it was in the first game, and each of those characters has at least one personal conflict they're dealing with, i.e. Jed is hiding her identity in more than one way, Levi is secretly a serial killer, Ashen Hawk is actually dead and has amnesia, and so on and so forth. And then all of these are connected to other characters' conflicts as well as the central storyline. Personally, I loved that because I felt like I was constantly learning something new that would put story threads into a different light. Granted though, because everything's so connected, it can sometimes be confusing, to say the least, but I do think overall the writing did a good job of connecting all these threads, not only in this game but also to the previous game. In particular, this is done well with the added addition of Lawrence and Elric and Rabbit, who are reincarnations of three of the characters from the first game, and having them as recurring side characters was a joy, and they added quite a bit to the lore whenever they showed up. But because there's so many of these plot threads, there were a lot that were either dropped or just left unresolved too. And that would probably be the main criticism I have with the game. Uh, there are also so many more tragic, bittersweet endings to be had here, and I felt like the reason a lot of big threads were left unresolved or vague was because this game was busy setting the stage for a third game in the series. 
Now, if there was a third game, or at least confirmation of a third game in the works, I'd feel a lot better about these unresolved plot points, but with that not being the case, it leaves me feeling unsatisfied to some extent with the storytelling. Moving on to the art, as mentioned before, it was definitely a change from the first game, but I think the style really fit this world perfectly. All the backgrounds had this cold look to them, and really conveyed this permanent winter atmosphere perfectly. I'm also a big fan of medieval historical settings, so the whole aesthetic of the town and the outfits really resonated with me. The main cast is made of a very attractive people, and as mentioned earlier, I was very impressed how so many of the townsfolk not only had sprites, but sprites that had different expressions to better convey the emotion in the scenes. The way the characters were animated with moving around and their multiple, multiple poses and expressions was excellent. In particular, the sword fighting was fantastic. It gave me such strong Hakuoki feels, which I absolutely loved. Once again, there were little cut-ins of objects, which I think were more beautiful than they were in the first game. While I didn't find the CGs in this game to be as beautifully breathtaking as Black Butterfly, there were still a bunch of gorgeous CGs, and I really liked how a lot of them had this clematis flower overlay in the corners. The music in the game was also great. It fit the medieval setting very well, and there were a lot of epic tracks that really elevated the strong emotional scenes throughout the story. The sound effects in this game were all great. Once again, a couple of these sound effects were a little too extra for what they were portraying, but I do think the sound effects were done much better in this game compared to the first. So, with all that being said, my overall opinion of this game is very good. While I don't think it quite surpassed or lived up to the magic of the first game, it was still a solid sequel that improved on some game mechanics from the first, like navigating the short episodes and had better overall sound effects. It also had some neat new additions, like a store where you could buy notes to learn more of the backstory. But as I said, the main thing that holds this game back, in my opinion, is the story not being as satisfying as the first, mainly because it left too many plot threads unresolved or only vaguely hinted at, as well as most endings being bittersweet with very few truly ending happily and with one of the main characters, T, being forgotten for 99% of the endings, which is crazy to me considering how big a part she had in the story until the ending point. Alright, now that I'm done talking about the game as a whole, I want to talk about our MC, Jed, or Air. Our girl really had so much going on with her. She had so many secrets she had to hide. Some on the fairly minor side, such as where she was living and who she was living with, to some major ones, which were hiding her red eye out of fear of being discovered as a witch, and hiding her gender so no one would think she could be a witch. Jed is definitely a tough cookie. She can sword fight, she's got an iron stomach, she works extremely hard as a handyman, she's very responsible and only buys things that she needs, not stuff that she would like to have, plus she's taking care of not only herself, but a ghost as well. She also cares deeply, not only for her adoptive family, but for the town as a whole. But that's not to say she didn't have some major demons to fight. The choices she made regarding using T's affection for her to her advantage in her quest to recover Algar's magical stone, for instance, was something that took me by a huge surprise. I did eventually learn that she was influenced by the bestial influence of the magical stone in her own eye, but the first time I went through that scene, I was never so ready to throw hands with an MC as I was in that moment, I swear. Though, I will say, I do like that Jed made that type of decision by herself without input by me. I think having that type of scene was also smart because it really gave me a greater understanding of how the urges and actions carried out by Levi, Lavon, and Algar were not entirely their own and were fanned by the influence of these magic stones. I think the weakest parts of Jed's character come to light in the endings. I couldn't help but feel like she was dragged along for the ride more often than having an active role in the endings. So many times it felt like she just resigned herself to what was happening and would act contrary to her personality up to that point, or she was puzzled, or she came across as hypnotized and had just given up control of herself to whoever she had gotten involved with. I can't say I was the biggest fan of that because I felt like it was such a rare thing for her to actually be happy in an ending. So while I do like Jed as a character and think she's pretty badass a lot of the time, I don't like how her agency is taken away from her so often by the end and how she kind of just rolls over and lets whatever happens happen. So 
there you have it. My general thoughts on the game as a whole, which means it's time to rank these roots. And just like in Black Butterfly, I have this divvied into three lists once again. The first one I'll go through is my personal ranking of the guys and their roots. The second will be who I thought Jed slash Air had the best chemistry with. And then the third one will include a ranking of all endings story-wise, with the Wolf Brothers, Happy Ends, Heroine, Lynx, and Traveler endings included. So, starting with the first list, dealing with our love interests. At the bottom, I'd put Levon, our heir to the Wolves and resident Yandere. He actually ended up being a rather mild Yandere overall. Yes, there were some invading personal space moments, but Boy really restrained his tendencies even at the end of his route. Right from the beginning of the game, it becomes very obvious that Levon seems quite smitten with our girl, even though she's pretending to be a guy. And despite the fact that they've grown up together since she was a baby as brothers. With how much this boy smiles at her and is constantly looking for excuses to be close to her and sad when she has to leave, my suspicion meter was immediately going off that he knows our girl is actually a, a well, a girl. And then when he really starts to get into our personal space, the Yandere alarm started to ring too. About halfway through the main story, there's a moment where Jed is able to see in Levon's heart, and based on the spicy scene she sees within, she figures out that he's been in love with her for a long time. And I'll admit, I'm a sucker for someone describing the person they love as their light in the darkness, so Levon got some pretty good brownie points for that from me. Of course, we also see what that darkness is in his heart, which is his warped understanding of who his father was and what being selfish means in relation to his role as heir to the wolves. And right after those massive revelations, plus Levon finding out his brother's also been a serial killer for who knows how long, our girl invites this boy to stay the night. And Levon decides then it's time to shoot his shot, while still leaving the choice up to our girl and whether things progress from there. So he gets another cookie from me for admitting the feelings she saw in his heart are real, but that he won't go further with her unless she's willing. And I'll admit, I was definitely expecting a kiss there between them, but I was not prepared for an actual Fate to Black scene to happen right then, so that really surprised me. I was disappointed after that though, as there's zero acknowledgement between Levon and Jed that that happened between them, and the story still plays out with Jed being jealous over Lugus, having fantasizing dreams about him, and being asked by Francisca's ghost if she's in love with Lucas. I do get that this game is a little on rails as far as main story is concerned, but even just some flavor text to acknowledge there had been a change in Levon and Jed's relationship wouldn't have gone amiss. But ultimately, that doesn't happen, and the only choice that really matters is near the end of the game when Levon actually says the words, I love you, to Jed and her choice after that. Gosh, though, that reaction from her after he says that is so lackluster. <laughs> I felt so bad for Levon through most of this route, to be honest. Boy has literally been obsessed with her since they were kids, and her reaction to him saying that he loves her is to nod. She has him so firmly entrenched in her mind as her brother at this point, even after they made out earlier, that it feels so weird to me. And I honestly think that might be the biggest reason why I can't really get behind Levon's route. While I completely buy his feelings for her, it doesn't really seem like she reciprocates. The other thing that kind of turned me off this route is the ending. I thought it was written well, and I liked that it tried to address Levon's ongoing issues of selfishness and his feelings towards his dad over what seemed to be a long period of time. But the sudden 180 of how earnest with his feelings Levon had been through the game and then how he suddenly turned that part of him off and became so distant was super jarring. For quite a while in that last chapter, I wondered if our girl had entered some weird dream state where she was just imagining what life would have been like if Levon had rescued her. Apparently that's not what happened though, and Levon just needed to get some sense talked into him by his dead, deadbeat dad, and Jed finally fessing up her feelings so that the two of them could finally move forward and turn their marriage on paper into a for reals marriage. And I will admit, the callback to the wedding vow episode earlier by having them go through the actual vows at the end of this and sealing it with a kiss was an awesome ending. It was just the pain and confusion of getting to that point, plus me not being wholly convinced of Jed's feelings changing from brotherly... sisterly? Sib siblingly? 
to romantically <laughs> that made Levon's root rank not as high as it had the potential to. After Levon, I'd put the next wolf brother, Levi, who was an absolute bean while also being a very effective serial killer. Levi's character usually wouldn't be one that I'd be that attracted to, but Levi is definitely a special exception just because he is so earnest and sincere that I can't help but be drawn to him. Additionally, his character arc and conflict are really well written. I was totally taken by surprise when it was revealed that Levi was the Black Shadow's serial murderer in the town, even though there are some subtle hints early on in the story to indicate that. And I just think it's a fantastic testimony to how well written of a character Levi is that, on face value, you wouldn't think a person who we've come to know as a very happy golden retriever type personality could also be a crazed serial killer, but I totally bought it with Levi. I loved that he was conflicted about being a killer because he knows that killing is wrong, but his perception of it has been warped both because of the stone's influence and also because the person he went to for help when he committed his first murder, i.e. his mom, praised him and really groomed him to continue his killings. And that more than anything broke my heart because it really feels like Francisca was very neglectful of Levi and or was angry at him more than anything. So. For her to praise him for something like this, I can see why Levi started having a positive view of killing, since he finally got some acknowledgement and praise from his mom that he so desperately wanted. That all felt so realistic and just made me feel for Levi even more. Plus, the main draw of Levi, for both Jed and me, is how he loves Jed because of who she is. Gender doesn't come into it for him, her being a witch or not doesn't come into it for him, he just loves her for her and because she makes him feel safe and is someone he wants to be around with and that is so wholesome and wonderful. I also feel like Levi and Jed's feelings for each other were supernatural and I bought into their feelings for each other very easily. I loved that Levi was so open about how he felt about Jed and didn't make a huge deal out of the fact that he loved her, which I think in turn helped her to fall for him more easily than his brother. It didn't feel like she was pressured into returning his feelings. It wasn't something that she struggled to comprehend because it was some grand thing. It was just a deepening of the care and feelings that were already there between them. And I loved that about their relationship so much. As for the actual ending part of Levi's Root, I will admit that it made me tear up a couple times because of how bittersweet it all felt. The two of them confessing to their feelings while separated by the bars of a cell and Imagining a happy future together when they both know things are going to end badly for Levi, with him facing justice for his crimes, was heartbreaking. The only thing I didn't like about Levi's ending is that I wish it had been a little more definitive. It's kind of left a little too open-ended for my personal taste. I am glad that Jed ran out there and didn't leave Levi in exile alone, but it all ended with them holding each other in a field of flowers and having nowhere to go and potentially starving to death. <laughs> It's the wording in particular at the ending that makes me worry for how long they last, since it says something along the lines of they held each other in the field of flowers forever and ever, which comes across to me as we held each other until we froze to death. <laughs> I really hope that's not what happened and that they instead moved in with Ghost Dad in the tower and figured things out. At least that's my headcanon. But yeah, if there had been more definitiveness to Levi's end, I think this would have ranked higher for me, but because of that, Levi is at the spot on my list. At number three, I gotta continue with my wolf boys and give it to Ashen Hawk, or as it is known, the Tower Overlord ending. I honestly had no idea what was going to happen with this ending, what with him not only being a ghost, but also being the father of our lovely wolf boys as well. And full disclaimer, even after learning all that, I still was game for this relationship to happen because I love Ash and Hawk, so I went into this fairly biased, if I'm being honest. <laughs> and I gotta say that his root had moments of hilarity and teasing, and these two really had such an old married couple vibe that I loved. One of my favorite moments in the game involves this couple too, which is after the masquerade, and Jed's walking through all that snow in her gorgeous dress to show off how she looked to him, and they shared a beautiful dance together in the tower. I loved that so much. As it turned out though, Ashen Hawk, or Apris as he was known before becoming ghostified, ended up being our Kagiha in this game. And what I mean by that is that we ended up in a psychedelica cage once again. As much as I enjoyed the route and the relationship between the two characters, I didn't like the vagueness of this end. 
It's really not clear how he saved her from the attic, how he got her back to the tower, and whether she was dying or... I guess dying's not really correct since technically they're all already dead, but I guess she was going ghost, more or less, becoming what Aphrodis became by slowly losing memories and sense of self. Other than the vagueness, though, this was a really bittersweet ending since you can see how much Aphrodis really came to care for Jed. He really views her as a savior of sorts to him and the person that became his world, and so he's both sad and happy that they're able to be together forever. And what's interesting is he's the one who actually calls what they're in a cage. The last CG of him holding her while she sleeps and protecting her with his cloak is so beautifully sad. It made for a really tragic ending, and I really enjoyed it. At number two, I have to give it to our heir to the Hawks, Lugus. With him being the love interest that the main story really pushes as the canon one, plus the whole star-crossed lovers and enemies to lovers vibes going on, how could he not have caught my eye right from the beginning? What really drew me to Lugus right from the start, as well as his honor and sense of justice, he takes his role of heir to the hawk super seriously, and he's a big family guy, having a lot of respect for his adoptive father and a great deal of care for his adoptive sister. He's got both brains and brawn by showing great insight in numerous situations, plus also being a fantastic swordsman. He's loyal, he gives all of himself for the lady he loves, and if this is sounding an awful lot like simping, then hey, you're not wrong. <laughs> but can you blame me? Lucas is just an all-around great guy, and his route had the most realistic buildup of romance out of, I think, any of the others. The way he and Jed got to know different sides of each other that they rarely showed others throughout his short stories was so awesome to see, and I totally bought their deepening feelings for each other. It felt really natural and believable, and I liked that Jed had this inner struggle of falling for this guy that she was convinced should be her enemy. However, the weakest part of Lucas's route comes in his ending. And really, it's the end part of his ending. The final meetup in the snowdrop field and confirming that he hadn't betrayed her and the two of them reenacting their first kiss was all fantastic. I even liked the poetic tragedy of Lugus causing Olgar's death when Olgar was the one responsible for Lugus's biological father's death. I also liked that Olgar and Jed were able to have some kind of a connecting moment right before his death. Plus, the fact that Olgar gave his life for both his adoptive son and his blood daughter was very touching. But, but, I felt like his sacrifice really didn't benefit Jed very much in the end. Yes, technically she didn't have to be executed, but our girl got locked up in an attic with no contact with anybody save for Lugas. She's only let out once a year on the night of the masquerade and is so weak that she can barely stand? To see such an active person like Jed reduced to that kind of state made no sense to me. I get wanting to honor the sacrifice of her father and lover boy, but I feel like there were so many other options available here. Like, why couldn't she just continue living at the tower instead of being cooped up in an attic room? Nobody knew she lived there. Also, literally nobody aside from Jed's closest circle knew about her female getup, so why couldn't she just go about town living her best life as heir? I mean, she still had the wig, as we saw when she went out the night of the masquerade with Lugus. It also doesn't sit well with me that someone who was as active as Jed doesn't even do some kind of exercise in her room. Girl, what happened to your character? <laughs> and the other thing that really bugs me in this ending is how T is not acknowledged at all. Lucas loved his sister so much, and for her to not get any kind of acknowledgement was crazy to me. So, because of all these things, the ending really ended up disappointing me, and prevented Lucas from ranking higher than he would have with a more solid ending. And finally, shocking possibly nobody, at number one for me would be Hugh, or Haku, or Ash, or Old Man, or whoever the heck he actually is. Boy's an absolute mystery no matter his form, and so it's no wonder he caught my eye. He speaks in a lot of vague sentences, and usually neither confirms nor denies anything, and just giggles at your absolute confusion. <laughs> One of my favorite things about a character like Hugh, though, is when other characters manage to confuse him. It's the funniest thing to me when a character who's supposed to be all-knowing gets confuzzled by the actions or words of other characters. In this case, particularly when it's usually Jed who's throwing him for those loops. Something else I liked about this pairing and this route is what the two of them bonded over. 
I think both of them found a kindred spirit in each other in that, due to their circumstances, they've been forced to play different roles and have not had the chance to discover who they really would be if those circumstances hadn't been against them. I personally really enjoyed these two's interactions since Jed had no preconceived notions about Hugh in comparison with the other guys, and she for her part won Hugh's respect and admiration to the point where he decided to get off the sidelines and aid her more actively. I also found it really funny how he'd keep kissing her cheek when he'd leave, and how unbothered she was by the whole thing. Girl stronger than I'd be if I was in her position. <laughs> But again, the weak part of this route comes down to the end of the ending. Leading up to it, we get offered a choice by Hugh. Jed can either kill herself and save the town that has forsaken her, or she can run away with him and help him regain the person he used to be. And as part of that deal, he wants the two of them to fall in love because he likes her. And I gotta admit, boy had some game by going in for the smooch after she took his hand. And then he opened the cell doors with his mind? and Bridal carried her all the way through the forest until he reached the tower. I was a big, big fan of that. <laughs> and of course, I also loved all the lore and backstory we got at the very end with the showdown between Hugh and Ashen Hawk. That was the most emotion I had seen from Hugh up to that point, and it definitely came across to me as though he was getting some revenge against Ashen Hawk as well by stealing away Jed. But Poor Jed really seemed to get the short end of the stick once again, as this was another ending where she felt fuzzy and hypnotized. Plus she got turned into a butterfly. I definitely feel she wasn't entirely in control of her decisions with this ending, but I mean, I hope she's somewhat happy trying to escape this world with butterfly Hugh. <laughs> she's at least not confined anywhere, so it's one of the quote unquote happier endings, possibly. And I also just really like Hugh a lot as a character, if I'm being honest, so that's why he ended up winning my heart out of all the guys in this list. Alright, there you have it. It wasn't easy getting my ranking straight for that list, but I think I managed to make it right in my heart, more or less. Now on to my second list, Jed's chemistry with the guys from least to greatest, in my opinion. At the bottom, as much as it pains me to do this once again, I think I have to put Levon. That boy worships the ground she walks on, but this girl literally had to go and talk to her ghost father-in-law and have him spell out for her that she might be in love. Because she kinda has to be talked into it, I'm still not entirely convinced she actually fell for him and had to be convinced that love must be what she feels for Levon. After him, I would probably put Levi once again. Just like his older brother, Levi's attraction to Jed is evident from day one. He views her as being the warmth in his life, and the only thing that was holding him back from pursuing her earlier is that he thought she was a guy. As soon as the cat's out of the bag about her being a girl, he pretty much asks right away if he can start hitting on her. And as for Jed's part, while she had bro-zoned Levi as well, it wasn't as strong as the bro-zone she had put Levon in. I felt like she was more open and relaxed with her feelings towards Levi, and that the growth of those feelings into something romantic was natural and believable in the lead-up to Levi's ending. My favorite thing about these two is how supportive they were of each other right up until the end, and how they were willing to sacrifice just about anything to ensure the safety of the other because of their care of each other. While the ending was bittersweet and open-ended, I like to hope the two of them figured out a plan to survive and thrive, and had the family they dreamed about having together. At number 3, I'd put Hugh. I think what helped Hugh to beat the Wolf Boys once again is that Hugh wasn't bro-zoned like they were, so... Jed was a little more open to trying a relationship with him. Right from the beginning, I couldn't help but feel like these two were drawn to each other. Their similarity in circumstances really drew them together, and I loved that that was the basis of their connection. Both of them appreciated that the other could see them, and I mean really see them. Hugh, for his part, viewed Jed not as a man, not as a wolf, or the witch, or any of the things that most people were viewing her for, but as a normal girl who was doing her best despite her circumstances, and he genuinely admired her for that. And while I'm not deluded enough to think that Jed ever saw the real Hugh, she was the only one to not have any preconceptions about him as well, and didn't wish for him to fulfill any kind of role for her. So she saw him as close to who he possibly could have been out of anyone, and that was more than enough for her. That was hands down one of my favorite things about these two and their relationship. And then from what we saw in Hugh's Traveler and Link's endings, I really felt these two had one of the more natural building of romantic feelings in the entire game. 
At number two, I have to give it to Ash and Hawk, or Apris. The chemistry between him and Jed was fantastic. Right from the beginning, they give off such strong old married couple energy, and they're a wonderful match personality-wise. He needs someone serious and hardworking to keep him in line and grounded, and Jed definitely needs someone more relaxed to remind her not to work so hard and to take time to relax herself and have fun. I also love that they were two people who were lost, but found a partner who made them feel safe, and who they could completely let their guard down around. Regardless of whether the feelings they had for each other were romantic or not, I think it's pretty clear that they cared deeply for each other and viewed the other as being their home, which I loved. And finally, at number one, I have to give it to Lugus. No contest, the sparks between Jed and Lugus were clear as day, and I loved the star-crossed lovers vibes coming from them basically from day one. I definitely think the buildup of their relationship was the best handled out of everyone and felt the most natural. They both had a deep respect for each other in the beginning that, thanks to a surprise kiss, quickly escalated into serious romantic feelings between them. They also had some serious obstacles to overcome, not only with regards to their feelings toward each other, but also their roles within their opposing houses, their duties, the town shenanigans, as well as a lot of family drama. But the two of them worked through it all together and only got closer as a result. Plus, I was a huge sucker for the Romeo-Juliet vibes of them in the heroine ending in particular. Her approaching him as the only one she could trust to kill her and take care of the town, and then him killing himself with the same sword that ended her life so he could go and save her from the abyss before the end, so they had a chance to reunite in another world was so tragically beautiful, and I loved everything about it. There's no doubt in my mind that Lugus more than earns his number one spot on this list. And finally, my third list. From least favorite to most favorite routes where story satisfaction was concerned, with the addition of all the other endings. At the bottom, I would put Happy End number one. There isn't really much to say about this one. This is one of those failing to make choices endings. It's technically happy since everyone's at the masquerade, having a good time, getting along as well as wolves and hawks can possibly be, but the ending is super abrupt. It ends before the story really starts taking off and you're just left feeling unsatisfied since zero plot lines get resolved and it really is just super abrupt, so I wasn't a huge fan of this ending. After that, I would put The Wolf Brothers end. I don't have much to say about this one either, honestly. It's a very quick ending that basically happens because of your indecision. While there aren't many choices in this game, there are still some choices that need to be made, and if you don't make a clear choice by the final chapter, then pure chaos is basically what happens. Any good progress made through the story is turned on its head, especially when it comes to our wolf boys. They really give in to the influence of the Kaleido gems and let their darker sides run free. On the one hand, I do love that those boys were fiercely loyal to Jed and wanted to save her from being executed, but they did murder basically the entire town and set it on fire in the process, and our girl broke down absolutely shattered amongst the flames as the boys looked down at her with no idea why she was reacting that way. Next on my list is Happy End number 2. It was a little more satisfying than Happy End number 1 was. It happens much later in the game when we storm the castle, so to speak, to take down Olgar. Killing Olgar is a bit sad since we never get the revelation about him being Jed's father or learning about what happened in the past in the town, but the town does prosper for a time at least after he's gone. Both the new lords have a peace treaty of sorts and are taking their roles seriously by the next masquerade. But this ending also suffers from some unresolved plot points. The biggest, most glaring one is that T's dropped like a hot potato again. For that reason alone, I just can't get behind this ending. I felt so awful for what she went through, and for her to be missing from this ending and not acknowledged in any way did not sit right with me. It also bothered me that Jed is excluded from the official masquerade proceedings. For someone who was the hero of the town, and also one of the wolf brothers, it feels so odd to not see her involved. And not only that, she's doing her handyman work. Girl be working on the biggest celebration of the year. I know she's a workaholic, but my goodness, girl. I think after that I'd list Ash and Hawk. This is mainly because his ending is so short. We do learn a little bit of backstory from Ash and Hawk, but overall it's also not the happiest end as our girl ends up possibly slowly dying slash transforming into a ghost and doesn't really know whether she's coming or going. Next up would have to be Hugh's route. 
I think what helped Hugh beat out Ash and Hawk for me is that his actual ending was more romantic from his side of things. We got a bunch of interesting lore bits. And while it seems like our girl got hypnotized once again in this ending, she did at least get turned into a butterfly and has a chance of leaving this awful town and has some company, so it's not the unhappiest of fates for her. After that, I'd put Lavon. While we didn't learn a lot lore-wise, I was a definite sucker for him and Jed renewing their vows, if you will, at the church, but for realsies this time. And I definitely got the sense that the two of them would have a happy and fulfilling life as Lord and Mistress of the Wolf Clan, even though we had to go through some rough intermediate scenes to get there. What I also really liked about Levon's ending is, I think with the exception of Lugus' ending, it had the longest period of time pass, and it was interesting to see Jed slowly come into her role as the wolf mistress. I also liked that we saw that Jed had some allies in town who believed in her, and I also liked that we saw at least one interaction between Levon and his dad where Levon finally takes the big step to start putting the past and those negative feelings away by returning his ring to Ashen Hawk and finally allowing himself to stop being a numpty and selfishly be with his lady love after all these years. Next, I'd put Levi. While I do think his serial killer arc could have been handled a little better, it definitely made his route more interesting than Levon's. I think Levi also had more overall character development than Levon did, and I was proud of him for not running away from his crimes, even though he easily could have. This ending also had a fair amount of time pass, as Levi and Jed sent letters back and forth for a while, and I really adored that they kept in touch that way, with Levon playing messenger boy for them. And I'm proud of Jed, too, for making the very difficult choice of not leaving Levi to his exile and going out to search for him. I definitely bought her feelings towards him more, so even though the initial end of his route is perhaps not the happiest, it did feel less forced from Jed's perspective, which helped Levi gain the upper hand on his brother here. Next up would be Lugus. This route fits in seamlessly with everything else going on in the main story, and everything builds wonderfully throughout. I thought the sacrifice on Olgar's part for his daughter and son was also very tragic and well done, and it was a great insight into how Jed felt about her dad when we didn't get much of that in the other routes. What held this route from being higher is, again, the ending of Jed being stuck in the Hawk's Attic, with only one day a year being let out, which I'll state yet again makes absolutely no sense to me no matter how I try to figure it out. It's a disappointing end to an otherwise great route, so I think this is a good spot for it here. After this, I put the Traveler end. It was such a different route from all the others. Basically, the main story gets completely abandoned, and our girl gets to fully embrace living in this town as a normal girl, falling in love in a normal way with a quote-unquote normal guy? That ending is probably as high up as it is for me because it really was a nice change of pace from the normal story, and it was neat because it felt the most like this is an ending Jed legitimately wanted for herself, but one that was out of her hands under normal circumstances. Thanks to what I'm sure was some tampering from Hugh, she gets the opportunity, and I felt like the two of them truly and naturally bonded and fell in love. I also felt like I both did and didn't learn about Hugh's story writing powers, and it was neat seeing some emotions from Hugh that I didn't think he was capable of. The next fruit on my list probably won't be that much of a shock since it's the Lynx one, which is nearly identical to the Traveler one, but with a more mysterious interaction with Hugh, who may or may not have spiked Jed's tea, <laughs> And it also included a fantastic epilogue with Hugh, Arya, and Olgar, which has some excellent extra story and lore, which I really enjoyed. And finally, at number one, and I'm sure this will surprise absolutely nobody, I have to pick the heroine ending. I had so many emotions going through that ending. This took everything that was great about Lugus's route, but with a much, much, much better resolution. Jed approaching Lugus with her plan to save the town, and him being the only one she could trust with going through with her difficult task of killing her. The two of them basically putting on a play for the town's sake to make Lugus the hero and Jed the evil witch that needed to be stopped was so beautifully done. And of course, the super Shakespearean vibes of Lugus stabbing himself with the same sword that killed Jed, not even cleaning the blood off of it, all so he could risk diving into the abyss to save Jed's soul so there was a chance for them to reunite again in a future life. And that gamble wonderfully paid off. I was so unprepared for it paying off in the future life being back in modern day with the cast from the first game in the real world. Even Hakage and baby Natsu are there! 
Air is hanging out with Ai and her crew now, it seems. And she does reunite with Lucas at the end, who's just transferring to her school and looking very, very handsome in his new look, I must say. And of course, it wouldn't be complete without one last shot of Hugh being mysterious on a roof and dissipating into butterflies. I also noticed after looking at those final CGs one last time that he seems to be wearing the same school uniform that Air and I are, so he might also go to their school because... Of course he would, wouldn't he? I basically spent that whole ending with my brain short-circuiting as I was processing what I was looking at, and I teared up multiple times, so this was definitely an easy number one for me. So, there you go, my three lists completed for this game. And with that, it's bonus awards time! Of course, first off, wolves are hawks. I'm definitely hashtag team hawks all the way. I felt they were more upfront with their issues than the wolves were, and I prefer the look of the Hawks Manor over the Wolves. They have better style. <laughs> My favorite background in the game has to be the Snowdrop Field. Aside from being gorgeous, it also has a mysterious and magical air to it that I love. Favorite CG of the game has to be the one of Ashen Hawk and Jed dancing. I love Jed's masquerade dress, and the two of them look so genuinely happy in that picture. I love the angle, their outfits. It gives me gothic vibes for some reason. I just really like that CG. Now while there's not many to choose from in this game, my favorite kiss CG easily goes to Lucas' second one. It paralleling their first kiss, but with more passion on both sides, was gorgeous. Saddest scene award I would probably give to Levi's last night in jail, and Jed and him holding hands and dreaming of a better future, though they knew it couldn't happen. The funniest scene in the game for me had to be the confession battle between Levi and T. The escalation of them trying to outdo the other to prove their love for Jed was everything, and on top of being hilarious, it's definitely one of my favorite scenes, just in general. The award for short episode I enjoyed the most would be the Cooking Together one. There's just something very wholesome about the whole wolf clan saving Francisca from a disastrous meal and making something delicious together. I always got hungry reading through that, and Jed was definitely in her element there. My favorite note, without a doubt, is To the Flower. Seeing Arya and Algar reunite after all this time made me so happy, and I'll admit I teared up a bit during it. Favorite townsperson would have to be the wolf boy who was having a crisis over choosing between his woman and his work. I'm still rooting for that boy. <laughs> Award for favorite side character has to be T. I'll probably be sore for a long time that she got forgotten in so many endings because She's an adorable Sundari that deserves so much better. My favorite piece of music in this game has to be the one that's currently playing right now, which is a remix from Black Butterfly called Invite. Black Butterfly's tracks already sounded nostalgic and magical, and this remix just amplifies that to the next level. Favorite masquerade outfit for the boys goes to Lugus. His reminds me so strongly of the Red Death costume worn by the Phantom and Phantom of the Opera. So, so good. Favorite piece of jewelry for me from this game is hands down Levi's ring. It is just so gorgeous with all the butterflies and everything on it. And I feel like the artist who drew for this game also really liked his ring a lot because it shows in a ton of the CGs and I am a big fan of that. And final award is for who had the best outfit in the game in general. And I gotta give that to my man Ashen Hawk. His outfit is so flowy and has so many layers to it. I love the puffy sleeves and the eye patch, and I absolutely adore that huge cloak he wears. And I think that's going to wrap this up! If you've made it to the end, then thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed my final thoughts on this. While it wasn't as strong as its predecessor, mainly lacking in a truly satisfying story, Psychedelica of the Ashen Hawk is still a solid game. I'd probably only recommend it if you really enjoyed Black Butterfly and want to experience more in this world, but I would add the caveat that you'll be left with a lot more questions than answers. If we ever get a third game that'll answer some of those questions, it would be very welcome indeed. But anyways, I can't thank you guys enough for joining me for this game, and I hope you all will share with me your lists and rankings as well. As always, if you have bonus awards of your own and would like to share, I'd love to read all about them. But with that, it is time to say farewell to Psychedelica of the Ashen Hawk. One more review left to go, and then we're on to two new adventures. If you're on my Discord, you probably know by now what the next games are going to be, but I will be announcing the new games as well here on YouTube at the end of my Heads and Tails final thoughts, so I encourage you to check that out. But once again, 
Thank you guys for joining me for this. I hope you all enjoyed it, and until next time, I will see you later.